Welcome to another episode of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Our special guest this week is Tristan Duke. Tristan, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners and watchers? Thank you, Kevin. Um, hi, I'm Tristan Duke. Uh, I'm an artist and uh, kind of a creative experimental artist and creative researcher uh, based in Los Angeles. And I do a lot of work involving cameras and optics and visual perception. Um, and I end up building a lot of uh, uh, tools to use in my work, actually, which we'll touch on at the end. Yes, there's using tools, and then there's making tools. Exactly. And using the tools to make tools. Okay, now we're getting meta. So, uh, <laughs> um, well, welcome, Tristan. Um, I'm really delighted. I'm a fan of your art, which is very um, often very technical, but still emotional. And um, I'm really, really delighted that um, you can share some tools with us. And just a little bit of a spoiler. We're going to do this into two parts. Um, there are so many great tools that we had that we're actually going to record two episodes, which will run either back to back or at some point um, in the future. So Tristan, what's your first um, tool? So my first tool uh, is actually a pretty simple oldie but goodie. Uh, and when I was talking to Kevin about this, I almost didn't put it on the list because I thought, you know, surely this might have been done to death on, on cool tools, but um, capped on tape. Um, and if people haven't used this tape or heard about its properties, it's, it's a pretty uh, useful tool. Um, so some of its uh, salient features. So this is a um, high temperature resistant, chemical resistant, um, high dielectric strength tape so and it's very flexible it doesn't leave residue and what this is often used for its kind of best known purpose is for um soldering so you can actually use this as like a heat shield soldering mask so if you want to uh protect certain components in a board um from spatter from soldering or from heat uh it can be used for that. Something that a lot of people are using it for nowadays is for lining the uh, the uh, build platform on a 3D printer. So this stuff really adheres well to ABS, especially. So it's a great liner for a build platform. But I found all sorts of other uses for it, including um, being able to... Uh, use this to cement together optical elements uh, when I was gluing using like Canada balsam to cement a prism onto some kind of uh, other other glass optics or if you're assembling uh, doublets where you have two lenses and you're doing it the old-fashioned way with Canada balsam which involves heat you can use this kind of tape because it has really high temperature tolerances um, so, 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 so the main the main thing is, it seems like is that it's uh, it's very stable in high temperatures, and that's I mean it can't, yeah. I can't believe it has any more insulation than anything else in terms of um, protecting from heat. It's just that it doesn't deform or degrade with with heat or yeah, is, yeah, it, exactly. It's it, and I've seen numbers. You know, there's various numbers quoted, and probably depend on the specific manufacturer. But I've seen numbers up to like. 750 Fahrenheit, for example, um, that this tape can hold up. So, you know, it's, it's a very high temperature tape. Um, yeah. And, and, um, for the benefit of those who are just listening and don't see it, it's, um, you know, it's on a normal three or four inch tape roll, but it has a kind of a glossy kind of plasticy look to it. Um, mm -hmm. it's very shiny. Yeah. And can all uh, the wall closer to yellowish. Um, and it, it, what's it made from? I mean, what is what is the material? Uh, let's see. It's a polyamide, I think, base okay. uh, with a with a silicone uh, adhesive on it. Um, 
So again, that's another really great feature. It doesn't leave residue on things. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a great tape, uh, for the right, right. kind of application. So that's why you might use it with optical stuff because it's not leaving a residue. Yeah, it's not leaving a residue. And specifically what I was talking about is when I was, you, you know, in this case, I was using uh, a Canada balsam adhesive to, which is a index matching glue, but it's actually, you know, a sap from a tree. So you, you have to heat it up to pretty warm temperatures in an oven. And if you want, you know, when the glue gets wet, things start sliding around. So if you want to, you know, keep it in place, uh, you can tape it with this and then bake it in the oven, let it all right, right. kind of get soft right. and cure up. So yeah. a, a short form might be if you have tape that will go in an oven or it has to endure flame or in yeah. some ways can it really, exactly. this is the tape you want. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. I didn't know about that. It's called, um, again, it's called what? Capton. Capton tape. Okay. And is that a brand or a, a type of tape? No, it's a type of tape, and uh, I think DuPont is the original and main manufacturer. Um, yeah. Okay. And I presume you can get different widths and different lengths. Yeah, and and actually, that's a good point. They make it up into, you know, I think six inch or maybe even more uh, widths. And, you know, Kapton tape, by the way, is used in you know, by NASA in satellite construction. Um, but then again, of its really high temperature range, um, cause it can also go down to like negative 250 degrees mm. Fahrenheit or something like that. Um, or more, uh, and also, you know, it can form like a really airtight, uh, seal, uh, dust proof kind of seal. It's, it's very soft and uh, flexible, so you can make really tight seals with it. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, for high performance, then. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Capped on tape. Okay, great. I didn't know about that. Thank you. So what's yeah. another? What's another tool, Tristan? Okay, so the next tool I have on my list uh, is black spray foam, and this might seem like kind of like a a dumb tool to include in the list, but I found this so useful and I feel like a lot of people might not realize that it comes that, you know, we're all familiar with, you know, great stuff, the, you know, uh, this kind of, um, uh, polyurethane expanding spray foam. But the reason I use this black, uh, variety is especially for, you know, being a photographer and doing a lot where I'm trying to make spaces light tight, making dark rooms. It's a really, really great thing for just instantaneously sealing up light cracks and making a space light tight with, which if anybody has tried to do this, uh, you know that it's like an extremely frustrating process because as you close up little cracks, there's always more kind of little light really finds its way. Um, and this stuff really, uh, seals light cracks like nothing else. And because it's black and because it has this closed cell form, it really just blocks all light. Um, this stuff is actually, notice it says pond and stone. So there, I think their intention with this is it's made for like pond features and waterfalls in people's gardens. So they made it black so that it would kind of disappear and, and you know, you can use it to kind of, fill the cracks between your like rocks and your waterfall. So it's also waterproof, um, but uh, really invaluable for sealing up a space and making it light tight. Right. I, going, going back to the, um, the sort of uh, never ending challenge for light tightness, the darker you make it, the more light leaks you see. Yeah, exactly. Right. It, yeah. As you, as you start filling in cracks, you think, you've really gotten it light tight and then you turn off the lights again and you realize there was a whole other level of light leaks, uh, that you're now only aware of because your eyes can adjust. So it's kind of this never ending thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, light, you know, if you look at the light gasket in a, in a, the door of a camera, for example, 
you always see that it has like this kind of uh, light trap kind of thing where, you know, the parts kind of fit into each other because light, it takes three bends, um, something like that. Three, you know, usually in my experience, at least three bends for the light to not be able to make its way through. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's really great. Is is there a particularly brand? Is there more than one brand that makes the black foam, or is it just one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a variety out there. Um, the other thing that's kind of nice is that this one, or at least was when I bought it, uh, available at Home Depot, um, and it's not with their other spray foams. It's over in the like outdoor garden, pond, oh. and you know waterfall area. So it's sometimes. Again, it's one of those ones where for years I didn't know this existed and I would try to use all sorts of other methods for filling uh, light cracks. And this this has really changed things for me. And what, what is the brand of that? This is this is actually great stuff. Oh, great stuff. Uh, okay. And it's just their um, pond and stone okay. version. And it, it says here, uh, black foam. So. Okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is really hard to life proof things. And um, yeah, it's that's a great tool. So, um, Tristan, what's your third tool? So, my third tool is um, this uh, Inkbird, is the brand. Um, it's, a, it, it's a temperature controller, it's basically a simple. EID that um, allows you to uh, regulate temperature in any kind of appliance. So, you know, here I have that to uh, 40 degrees Celsius. You can change it from Celsius to Fahrenheit. And then there's this little, um, you know, there's this little thermostat probe that comes out of it. You can put this into whatever you're trying to control the temperature of. And then what's really nice is you basically just have these two plug outputs. You have a cooling and a heating output. So what's nice about this thing is if you want to, you can even have some kind of air conditioning unit and some kind of heating unit. Like you could have a cooling fan and a heat pad set up so that you could really have that, you know, positive feedback wow. control. And you can, you know, there's a lot of settings on it. You can decide what kind of tolerance, what kind of window you want. You can let it heat above a threshold before it kicks in and all sorts of things like that. But, you know, I've used this for everything from, you know, chemistry applications where if you want to turn just a regular crock pot or, uh, you know, one of those um, hot water kettles, electric hot water kettles into a temperature regulated heater. You can do that um, to, uh, you know, kind of fermentation and culturing in the kitchen. Like you can, uh, if you're making yogurt, you can use this to regulate your temperature and uh, create a, a, a nice temperature controlled environment. And what is the range of temperatures? Uh, like you know, I'm not sure 20, what the minus you know, 20 to yeah, I'm not sure we did. Oh, here we go. Temperature range is negative 58 to 210 Fahrenheit. So 210. Yeah. So, huh. It stops it boiling. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great tool. Um, I've, I've found it really a useful thing to have around, um, for all sorts of all sorts of applications. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of your universal thermostat. Yeah, yeah. Like one one application I used this for, I was creating a um, film drying locker. So I had a dust tight kind of cabinet, and I put a um, a fan on it with a heater into the, you know, blowing into the locker with a filter so that it's not blowing dust in. And it was a light tight kind of uh, film cabinet. And then I just had this probe running in and I could decide if I wanted to maintain the heat at a certain level. So if I wanted the heat to be slightly elevated, like an 80 degree environment, um, 
to uh, speed up drying, you know, and I could adjust it remotely from outside. So you can really do a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah. You can make a kind of a temporary paint drying box if you wanted to or mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and this I think is actually marketed as a um, thermostat for like reptile enclosures, or at least um, when I was looking online, that seems to be what a lot of people use this for. So you can keep your uh, your reptile terrarium at the right optimal temperature. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah. So that's why it doesn't go above boiling. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, that's Extreme really wild. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and what's what, what, what um, what's it called again? So this is called the uh, Inkbird Plug and Play Thermostat. Thermostat. Okay. So yeah. it's a plug and play thermostat. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And your fourth pick for today. This is a um, essentially like a. Uh, online uh citation sort of bibliography tool it's an open source reference management software i guess you could say and basically this allows you to build custom libraries with citations of books articles and media but what's really great is that it pulls this metadata directly out of so there's a web browser extension and a little icon of the Zotero icon will appear at the top of your web browser. And let's say you're looking at a book on Amazon or in Google books or whatever you can, uh, or even in a library catalog, it'll, it'll pull, it'll rip the metadata out of that citation. And it automatically recognizes for the most part, if it's a book article, movie, you know, whatever you want to cite, and it will create this, citation so you know if you want to look up here's my section on cloud chambers which were an early form of particle detector these are different so some of these are actually just websites where i saw something like this mm-hmm. is a peltier uh thermoelectric cooler that i thought could be useful in in a project and it creates a snapshot actually of the website so this is really cool because um it's almost like your own personal internet archive. So, right. you know, you know, the Wayback machine. Sure. So let's say you go to a website and you're seeing information on there. And how many times have you had the experience of going back and the website has changed? And then it turns out that, you know, uh, the internet archive didn't capture it. So if you have data that you want to preserve in a certain iteration, you can create your own essentially archives. Um, and I'll just show you like, here's a, here's a citation, for example, for a book, this is called holography, a practical approach. And, um, you can see this, all this data, um, it pulled directly in this case, it pulled it from Google books. It has the ISBN, the publisher, the author title information. Um, and and, and, and when you were, where were you when you made this citation? Were you on like an Amazon page of the book, or was it, uh, are you saying that it was somewhere mentioned the book by, by name and then it went and found Yeah. So, so in this case I was, you know, on Google books and uh, there was a, you know, uh, a record for this. And and when you pull up in the browser, a record, or say you're on Amazon and you're looking at a book, like I'd like, maybe I want to buy this or maybe I want to reference it later. Mm -hmm you can actually, um, you know, just hit the little icon that appears in your browser with the, with the plugin and it, it'll automatically pull this data for you. And it'll give you an option and a pop-up right there, whether you want, you know, which collection you want to put it in. Mm -hmm. Another great example of how I've used this is anytime I buy a new book on Amazon, I just go ahead and, uh, cite it to my Zotero uh, library and I put it in a folder that's my personal library of books that I own. So what that means is then I have actually an uh, automatically generated index of all the books that are in my, on my shelf. So it makes an easy way to search that. The other really cool thing is, you know, if you're in a more academic kind of way, 
you can actually generate citations directly out of this software. So you can you can export an MLA, APA, or Chicago citation, and it makes management of referencing these kinds of things really, really easy. But the main thing that I use it for, honestly, is it's a really great place to put articles. So if you if you find a PDF of, um, you know, here is here is a uh, something where I have PDF scans actually that I made myself that then I put under the citation. Or in other cases, you might find like the entirety of a paper, for example, that's been published, and then you can actually have that available. Evernote does some of these things. How 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 would you describe the differences between Evernote and Zotero? You know, I I haven't used Evernote. I know that it has uh, some of the same kind of functionality. Zotero is something I've been using for a long time. It's a it's an open source platform kind of thing. Um, I can't really compare and contrast because I've never really used Evernote. I guess maybe one thing is that um, it looks like Zotero is storing all the information on your own computer, whereas I think Evernote is a little bit more in the cloud. Yeah, this this does, this does has cloud, so, you know, you can think, you know, I have this synced with the cloud, so, you know, you can, so it does have cloud-based capabilities, but, yeah, you, you know, it creates folders uh, where all this stuff is also accessible on your machine. Um so it's more of like a cloud backup rather than actually just mm-hmm. cloud. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you say it's and, open- it, and it syncs and it syncs between. So if you have multiple machines, it will sync your libraries. And um, you said it was. Is it open source? Meaning that it's just literally open source, or is is it also free? Or um, it's free. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's it's run by Zotero Zotero Foundation. I think they're called Zotero.org. You can. Right. Uh, go Good. online. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so Taro. So yeah, it, it looks, you know, it's working kind of within your own file directory, but I guess you say you have a little um, plugin icon for your browser. Yeah, exactly. You can, you can get a, you can get plugins for all the different browsers. Um, yeah. Okay. All righty. Um, that's really great. Yeah. It does remind me of Evernote. Um, in some ways, but Evernote is pretty much hosted, I, I believe. And mm-hmm, so that's, mm-hmm. that would be a concern as time goes on. Um, you know, if they were to go away, what happens to all your, your data? Zotero has the advantage of um, being something you have a little bit more control over. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if there was maybe an export function from Evernote. Yeah, yeah. I would hope so. I mean, I think that's the danger. That's always my concern with a lot of these heavily cloud-based uh, kind of platforms is what happens when, you know, ten it's 10 years from now and the whole landscape has changed. Yeah. So um, th- those are really great. Um, things I didn't know about, I'm always really, really delighted and eager to hear about tools I didn't know about and you gave us a whole bunch of them. Tristan, can you talk about your current projects that you're working on or passion that you have these days or your mission? Yeah. What's up? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I thought that I would share with you um, actually uh, a piece that I, uh, that I did and uh, maybe some of the tools that I kind of built uh, to create this piece. Um, Yeah. So what I wanted to talk about today is, uh, this piece that I made for the Exploratorium for Aperture Lucida. And since the topic of this show is tools, uh, I'm going to talk about tools for making this hologram in this case. This piece, Aperture Lucida, was an immersive hologram installation uh, at the Exploratorium. Basically, uh, I'm going to play a little video while we're talking here. Just turn off the sound. Um, So for those of you who are listening and can't see this, uh, what we're seeing is this kind of giant uh, monolithic black wall um, that's hanging in a gallery. And there appears to be a ball of light that hovers out in space from this uh, this black wall. 
and people can walk right up to it and interact with this ball of light. Um, and actually, as you walk up to and put your head into the ball of light, uh, the whole kind of illusion sort of explodes and you realize that what you had thought was this monolithic black wall is in fact riddled with holes and these precision aligned holes are what give rise to this illusion. So what you thought was this ball of light coming out into space, you are in fact actually just seeing through holes um, to the white gallery walls behind it. And so uh, this, uh, it's a very uh, simple optical illusion, uh, but it, at this kind of scale and um, in this kind of uh, context, it creates a really dramatic effect. Um, so I've included here a diagram for those who are watching to give a real sense of how this thing works. Actually, all of the holes are oriented to be pointing at one place in space. So, um, and th that's what gives rise to this kind of illusion. And to make this piece, uh, I used uh, a uh, the SR100, it's a Haas uh, full sheet router, um, CNC machine. Um, and this required uh, drilling and routing literally uh, I think we calculated that it was close to half a million holes, um, all precision aligned. Um, but that's not what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about where this idea came from and the simple tools that I used to prototype the very first vision of it. So again, the basic concept is just uh, holes all oriented towards the point in space. And so the very first tool that I used to create a prototype was this um, basically uh, it's a board with uh, a bunch of uh, with, with a, a needle on a rod sticking through it and it can pivot around and poke holes and all the holes end up oriented at the same place. And what, so, are, you, um, what are you poking holes into? So in this case, this is a foam core sheet. Uh -huh. um, and you can see here uh, after some initial prototypes with that, I realized I wanted to get a little more precise. And here is a um, a uh, gimbal that I machined. Right. Um, and so this gimbal actually allows me to uh, pivot the, um, the rod up and down and poke holes, again, all oriented towards the same place in space. And just to give you a sense of what that process looked like, I spent hours, uh, I think actually cumulatively uh, weeks by the end of it, uh, just poking holes one at a time. And, and remember, and it, it, yeah. It, it, it looks like it. they didn't need to be actually on an explicit grid. You were kind of making them more kind exactly. of random. Yeah, and, and in this case, so I, I just went free form here. And really all that matters is that the holes all orient towards the same place in space the uh, and uh, just since you're showing us the the final um artifact what what were those holes drilled into um that was drilled into a plastic uh a plastic sheet um and so for that i actually one of the the real challenges is that this is kind of an interesting example so so here's the actual gimbal device right. if you can see this and, you know, you get a sense, it's just a very simple device so that the holes, you know, out here are going to poke at an extreme angle. The holes in the center are going to poke straight down. Right. And it turns out that actually this motion, which is fairly simple to do with this device, is uh, really hard for a three axis CNC machine to do. So I had to go through a lot of uh, special engineering to get that this object made using a three axis, because once you go up to a four, five axis machine, it's like, you know, a much more complicated, uh, more expensive proposition. Um, but here I'll just hold up to give you a sense and you might be able to see this. Yeah. Um, so, and you see this like 
you know, subtle kind of ball of light. And, yeah. you know, you're viewing this on a screen. So, of course, um, you're not seeing the three dimensional effect, but you can kind of tell from as I move it around that it's as if there's, it's tied to the surface and it has a kind of depth effect. And right. um, so, this actually was made, you know, just using this very simple hole poking device. Um, you know, here is, here's another version that has a, a different effect. Um, wow. Yeah. So you can see, you know, again, I just wanted to share because I think that sometimes when people have ideas or they think about things, um, the immediate thing to go to is the special tool that you don't have that you need to, to, even start on your idea and then right. people give up because it's overwhelming. And I just wanted to show that progression because it started with just a board with a hole drilled in it, because that's what I could do that day. And then once I tried that, I realized, okay, I could push it a little further. And I made this fancy little gimbal, but again, that's what I could do that day. And that is what led to the exploratorium, you know, grand piece on a big scale. And I think it's important to kind of show that to people because uh, that's how ideas, you know, when you see something in a museum, it's usually the big grand idea that, and you don't see any of the work that led up to right, it. Right, right, right. It's all a, a, a string of prototypes, one after another. Exactly. The whole way along. That's um, actually this little, I have a new book out about excellent advice for living. And that's one of my bits of advice is, for your own life, don't make grand plans, just prototype it um, bit by bit. And that idea of having to redo things in successive prototypes was, I wish yeah. I knew that. I wish I knew that when I was 20, that that's how you do it. Because when I was 20, the thought of redoing something was just, it was so yeah. distasteful. So, so um, I don't know. It would just seem so much like a failure that, yeah. I didn't think of it, but now I'm totally with you that the easiest, quickest cardboard thing, and then you just go up from that. And even when it gets to be expensive, you figure you're still going to make one to throw away, right? You're still right. going to get it right on the first time. And I don't know if that's true with what you were doing with your mill, whether or not you actually had to make a couple to get it to work right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's also, this is also how people design them. So, you know, we, we talk about painting ourselves into a corner. People design themselves into corners all the time. If you don't do that prototyping, you know, in the prototyping stage, cutting a hole in the cardboard prototype to yeah. add something or taping something on is easy. But if you've already designed a beautiful stainless steel enclosure <laughs> and you're, you know, you're already at that stage and you realize that you need to plug this new thing in. It's a, it's a total disaster. Right, right. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so what you're talking about is you're, you're making prototypes, but also part of that may be where you're making tools as part of that prototyping. You're actually kind of um, exactly. making things that you might need later on to make the final thing. Yeah. 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 Well, that's really great. Well, well, um, and that piece where does that piece live? I, I had had the privilege of seeing it at the Exploratorium, but does it, is it continue on somewhere else right now? Yeah. It? Yeah. So actually currently uh, it's in storage at the Exploratorium. It's part of their permanent collection. Now um, we're working on getting it uh, onto the floor in a permanent location. It just requires moving some things around okay. at the Exploratorium. So it should be back, uh, any any time now they they're telling me that this year is looking likely to to be able to relaunch it so and, and, and they it, posted it wasn't evident from the description there is this hovering light kind of in 3d that you see and there's no electronics involved whatsoever it's a completely physical inert in a cer certain sense yeah. piece of material that produces this uh optical illusion Exactly. And it, it's actually the basis of it. You know, I, I, I've described the general sort of phenomenon as being a moray hologram. So if people are familiar with moray patterns, like 
when you're driving on the freeway and you see two chain link fences line up and there's this kind of larger pattern, it's kind of capitalizing on a similar optical effect, but it's a much more controlled and constrained sort of version of a moray. Yeah. It's a, you know, yeah, you're managing the moray or it's a, right. Mm -hmm. Engineered moray. So you could imagine, and I'm sure you have other things you might do with a similar kind of um, engineered moray. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's something that I really want to return to because it, it really has a lot of promise. I think there's a lot of things that could be done with it. Yeah. Well, Tristan, thank you. It's really fabulous. As I said, I'm really delighted by your choice of, um, of tools and, um, thank you for sharing your tool making, um, apparatus as well. Of course. Thanks for having me. This year, our Cool Tools blog will be 20 years old, which means we've been posting something new every day for 20 years. It's only possible because of the very engaged and knowledgeable readers and listeners like yourself. You've kept this place going, and we are very grateful for you. With this idea of 20 years in mind, um, we decided to try an experiment this year. And I'm inviting our guests and listeners to join me on our Cool Tool Show and Tell, which is the program that you're listening to right now. So if you feel you'd make a good guest on this podcast and have four uncommon tools that you'd like to share with us, um, please sign up on our form on the website and we'll see about inviting you. You must be comfortable taking on, talking on a video and um, you need to have some tools that you can show. Um, we record on, as you know, on Zoom, we do a YouTube version, a visual video version of it, as well as an audible version. Fill out the form if you're interested and um, list your four, four cool tools and we'll see if there's a good fit. The applications aren't guaranteed in any way. Um, and we're looking at tools that are new to us and appropriate tools and um, whether the times will work for you. So um, we're really interested in hearing from people all over the world, not just in the U.S., although the tools have to be available online, easily available online. And um, if you are a longtime listener, you kind of know what the definition of our tools are. They're very broad. They can be anything that's handy, from something in the kitchen to something used to travel to a workshop to something professional that we may not know about. We're really interested in things that we don't know anything about. So um, this is an open invitation. We'll give it a try. If you think you make a good guess for this podcast, um, fill out the form. There'll be a link somewhere on our website. Um, and we look forward to, to chatting with you. Thank you.